part, part one of the sleep notes for our new sleep unit. Um, and we're going to start by taking a, a look at uh, how much sleep teens need and how much they actually get. Um, you probably noticed from the sleep survey that you took that you really don't get enough sleep and you didn't need to take the survey to understand that. Um, <coughs> you, as, like most teens, don't get the recommended amount, which is uh, between eight and 10 hours of sleep per night. Um, the average high school senior gets much less than that, between uh, you know less than seven hours. 6.9 hours, according to a ma uh, like a major study that was done um, on over 1,000 teenagers across the country, um, and the average amount over a period of uh, weeks was only 6.9 hours of sleep. And what's the big deal? Well, sleep, as you'll see, is one of the most important things you do uh, every day. It's imp it's if it, if it's at least as important as nutrition for good health. Um, and humans are not alone in terms of sleeping. All mammals, of which humans are one, uh, all birds and reptiles, all of them sleep in some way. It's not unique. Um, but a sleeping animal is easy prey, meaning you get unconscious basically for multiple hours per day. You become vulnerable to an attack, right? Like that little rabbit there. Um, when you're sleeping, you can't protect yourself. So how can, why do so many animals sleep then? It doesn't sound like a good system to have animals that like survive for millions of years, you know, like if they have to sleep all the time, you'd think that they would get, um, you know, they would die off because other animals eat them. Maybe animals who didn't need to sleep. Well, it turns out all animals need to sleep. Um, even though it doesn't seem like the smartest idea. Well, there must be something to it though. Um, the sleep researcher, Alan Rechtschaffen, said, if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function, it's the greatest mistake evolution ever made. Evolution says our, the role, uh, the role of, um, of natural selection is, to, is that any kind of organism, whether it's a human or a, or a monkey, <coughs> will, the, the, they will pass on their genes um, if they are healthy enough to live until uh, childbearing age, and then they reproduce. If you think about how dangerous sleep is, it's kind of amazing that so many species have actually survived. Um, so bottom line, it has to serve some kind of crazy important vital function in order for us to sleep, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. But do we know why we sleep? No, well, not really, believe it or not. Now, this question here, these questions, why do we need food and water? Why do we need protection from extreme heat or cold? Obviously, for the first two, we would die otherwise. And it looks as though the, the, the same answer applies for why do we sleep? It seems like we would probably die without that too. Now, the whole concept of why do we sleep has been baffling scientists for as long as they've been studying sleep. Um, we don't really have a great answer for it yet, um, but we ha we know some of the things that that sleep can do for us. We just don't know why we have to sleep. Why not? Why can't something else do these things for us? Why does sleep have to be this, you know, this thing that takes a third of our lives away from us? Um, so one thing we know now is that sleep quality affects every single organ in your body and every system for that matter. So um, how well or poorly you sleep is going to affect your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your brain. Uh, it's going to affect your immune system, your digestive system. It's going to affect your metabolism. Everything is affected either positive, positively or negatively based on how good or bad your sleep is. Uh, sleep is also restorative to an extent. In other words, it rests the tired body, but it can't be the whole story though. It can't just, just resting you can't be the reason why we sleep because you'd think that people who are more active during the day would need to sleep more, right? Or the people who didn't do much during the day ha didn't need as much sleep. 
but that's not true. People who are very physically active don't necessarily need more sleep than people who don't do much at all. Even people in the hospital who are in bed and don't do much of anything, they still need to sleep. Um, sleep fights infection. When uh, it helps you when you're sick to sleep more because it, it'll make you help you get better. Uh, sleep helps you to deal with stress when you're dealing with stressful situations. Sleeping more can help you get through that. And REM sleep is so helpful for our memories. Uh, REM sleep, you'll remember rapid eye movement sleep is when uh, you have your most vivid dreams. And it turns out that that sort of sleep totally helps us uh, with our memory and our and learning. People do much better uh, on tests of learning and memory when they have slept and had enough REM sleep. Um, and we don't mean here learning like school learning necessarily. You learn every single day uh, and you learn for your whole life. Anything you didn't do when you were born, you had to learn, right? You didn't come out like knowing how to do things. So you, you learn how to do stuff constantly. And when you don't sleep enough and don't get enough REM, you can't remember things nearly as well. And not only that, if you don't have enough REM sleep, in other words, you don't dream enough, your body's going to make you pay for it by dreaming more. That's called REM rebound. REM rebound happens when you don't get enough REM sleep one night. Well, then the next night, uh, you will tend to dream more and have more REM sleep, more minutes of REM sleep to make up for it. That's how important it is. Now, it really does appear that we would die without sleep. Uh, no two ways about it. Um, and there are a couple of pieces of evidence of this that support this concept that if you go without sleep for long enough, you will not live. Um, rats have been uh, used in sleep deprivation studies. You can't study humans for obvious reasons, but you can study other other animals. And rats have been studied to see what will happen if they are completely sleep deprived. Um, no, at, well, you know, when they were first doing these studies, people didn't necessarily know what would happen. Um, but as it turned out, if you just completely sleep deprive a rat, they will die within two to three weeks. Um, all of them, like all the rats in these studies will die within two to three weeks of complete lack of sleep. And the way they sleep deprive them is by putting, they put them on a platform that is just large enough for the rat to be on when they are awake. Because if you fall asleep, you lose muscle tone and you, you would like fall. So the rat would fall off this little platform if he fell asleep. Well, if he falls off the platform, he falls into a, a tub of water and rats really don't like water. So they scramble to get right back up on that platform. So uh, they that's how they keep them sleep deprived. Um, we can't do this with humans, obviously, uh, but there is a very rare genetic disorder called fatal familial insomnia, where people basically live the, the, the final months of their lives with no sleep. Um, it's fatal, meaning it runs in families. Uh, sorry, it's fatal, meaning it kills you. Familial, it runs in families, and it's a form of insomnia where people can't sleep, stay asleep, or uh, fall asleep. It's incredibly rare. <clears throat> um, something like 100 families in the entire world have this. It all uh, can be traced back to one man in, in, in Italy in the late 1700s who had a gen, uh, basically a genetic mutation. And what happens is between usually the ages of 40 and 50, it can happen to men and women, um, you stop being able to sleep as much as you normally do. Uh, you, you, you might wake up in the middle of the night and it, it'll originally look like normal insomnia, but then it gets worse and worse. And about six months in, you'll stop being able to sleep entirely. And almost all of the people die within 18 months of this, um, of, of the beginning of this disorder. Uh, and when they do like a, an autopsy, there's really no cause of death other than they didn't sleep. That they can't find any other cause. It's not like they had a heart attack or things like that. It just looks like sleep was the factor. So it's that important. Um, when it comes to sleep deprivation, you know, we all of us have it from time to time. Um, your book mentions or the the reading. Um, 
section that I gave you talked about this kid named Randy Gardner, and he was a, a high school student in San Diego, and he had a science fair to do, and he wanted to do for his project, he decided he would do a, uh, an exp- basically test himself to see how long he could go without sleep, and he wanted to break the Guinness Book of World Record record for sleep deprivation. And to do it, he had um, a, like a couple of his friends stayed with him. Um, the guy, the kid, there's a kid on the left in each of the, in each of the photos above the kid on the left is his friend who stayed with him. Um, Randy's the one in the middle in both pictures. Um, you know, he, they make him do push-ups, play basketball, do all different kinds of things. The, the person on the right in both of those pictures is a famous sleep researcher back when he was very young, just starting out uh, named William Dement, and he studied what happened to Randy. To see, he was very curious what will happen to a person if they go so long without sleep. And it turned out when Randy started to go, when he ended the experiment just shy of 11 days, he slept for six hours extra the first two nights. So that's like 14, 15 hours a night for the first couple of nights, and then a couple of hours extra for like a week or so. and um, and he slowly started to make back at least some of his lost sleep. And that's called sleep debt. Sleep debt means we, when you lose sleep, you got to pay it back. Think of being awake as something that is not free. You, owe, you have to pay back your body for being awake and you pay back by sleeping. Um, so for every two hours awake, you roughly owe your body uh, one hour of sleep. So. Um, if you're up for, you know, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., that's 16 hours. Well, eight hours is one hour for every two hours you're awake. Um, and the effects of sleep deprivation are really similar to drunk driving. And that is um, that is really made clear by the fact that there are thousands and thousands of drunk, uh, sorry, of, sl- of drowsy driving accidents every year where a person falls asleep and crashes and thousands of them are fatal sadly so if you ever find that you're like getting tired when you're driving that is a signal to stop driving pull over and take a nap um for real like it's not um it's not something you can control turning the radio on rolling down your windows won't help if you tape a person's eyes open and and they are going to sleep you cannot stop them they will still fall asleep with their eyes taped open it's not nothing you can really do about it so don't play around with drowsy driving so sleep is known as a circadian rhythm um circadian means around a day circa comes from the latin word for circle around and dn the Latin word for day, around a day. So in other words, 24 hours. And circadian rhythms are these biological rhythms in your body that change throughout a 24-hour period. Well, in other words, over the course of a day. These rhythms include your sleep-wake cycle. In other words, how drowsy or alert you are. That fluctuates and changes throughout the day. Some parts of the day you'll be really alert. Some parts you'll be really uh, drowsy. Other rhythms include things like blood pressure, which rises and falls throughout the day, predictably, and your body temperature. So, and that's just three things. Um, You have many, many more of these you can can look up if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, So how does this work? Well, for one, your body has these two drives that are kind of fighting each other all day, two opposing drives. Uh, one is to keep you asleep and one wants you to be awake. You have what's known as the homeostatic sleep drive. This is a basically a biological drive within, within you to make you sleep. And that is going up against the circadian alerting system. Both of these do the opposite thing. And both and one of them wins at parts of the day and the other one wins at other parts of the day. The homeostatic sleep drive wants you to, to sleep and the circadian alerting system wants you to be awake. Um, so what happens to make you finally lose out to the homeostatic sleep drive and actually fall asleep at the end of the day? Well, 
there are th- some th- three main factors that, aff- that aff- are going to affect your sleep drive. The first is a chemical called adenosine. It's a neurotransmitter and it causes drowsiness and it starts being produced and the levels grow and grow from right when you wake up in the morning, the levels of adenosine build. And basically by the time you've been awake for 16 hours, they reach about the most they're going to be all day after about 16 hours. And when you sleep, they go down, 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 down until you wake up and they're pretty much depleted by then. All right, so there's one thing, adenosine. You also have the effect of light, uh, especially sunlight, but it could also be artificial light. Sunlight affects sleep because it triggers uh, the brain. The presence or absence of light sends signals to the brain through this amazing brain structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Say that five times fast. Uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is this tiny little structure. See that arrow pointing to the little pink thing there? Uh, that is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And when the light starts to, to go away, it triggers a part of your brain called the pineal gland to release melatonin. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of melatonin. It's You can buy pills of it at like, uh, supplement and vitamin shops, you know, um, to help you sleep. Um, melatonin causes drowsiness. So when the, the light goes away, the sun goes down, you have this increase of melatonin in your brain. And you might have even, you might experience it even more strongly now since we just lost daylight savings time recently and the days are shorter now. You might feel like you have less energy. Well, that makes sense because your melatonin starts being produced earlier in the day for you now. And finally, the third factor is the hypothalamus, which it's, you might, you might remember this one, this from our last unit on the brain. Um, the hypothalamus switches off the brain's arousal signals. And among other things, remember, it, it's, it does um, have a major role in hunger and uh, drinking and the sex drive. Um, hypothalamus also is involved in sleep. And you combine the effects of adenosine with light and melatonin and combine that with hypothalamus. And then your body can't resist and you fall asleep. So how long have people been actually studying sleep scientifically? Maybe not as long as you'd think. Um, The biggest breakthrough came in the 1940s with the invention of the EEG or electroencephalogram, um, which measures the brain waves. It measures the electrical activity in your brain. And maybe you've seen these on TV before. The woman has these sensors attached uh, like with some uh, adhesive to her head. And it's going to um, measure the electrical activity at certain points in her brain while she sleeps. And it produces a, uh, a readout like you see on the right-hand side of the bottom. Those squiggly lines are what the EEG produces. And we knew almost nothing about sleep until the invention of the EEG uh, because it gives us such a window into what your brain is actually doing at night. Before the EEG basically pulled back the curtain on sleep, uh, all we knew about sleep was that you were awake or you're asleep, and that's about it. Um, We now know that sleep is a very dynamic process where you have lots of different changes uh, during the night. Now, these are different ways you can read an EEG, those the, the squiggly lines on the lower right that I had been talking about. Two ways that they can differ. First is called frequency, which is a another way to, to refer to the speed of the waves. Both of these waves are different frequencies. The one on the left is a lower frequency wave, and the one on the right is higher frequency because there's more ups and downs in the same space of time. So the the farther apart the lines are, the slower they are. And the closer together they are, the faster they are. So the one on the left is slower. The one on the right is faster, which means your brain is more active if it's going faster. All right. So there's how close they are together or how, how, 
high is the frequency. And then we look at what's called amplitude. And this is really easy too. You just look at how tall they are. Uh, so that you can easily see that the one on the left is shorter than the one on the right in amplitude, amplitude or height. The lower amplitude, the shorter one means the brain's faster. The one on the right there at the bottom, that tells you the brain is slower. So the shorter, uh, shorter waves are faster. The taller waves are slower. Let's kind of see some real brain waves and we can use some of these terms. So in this um, picture here, you see a bunch of different types of brain waves, re EEG readouts for different uh, states. Uh, the first one you see awake, that top line, the lines are very close together and relatively short, which is what we'd expect because when you're awake, your brain is active. Stage one, the second line down, Look at how those lines, its they start to like spread out. They're not as closely packed together. They're still very short, but they start to spread out more. Stage two, uh, take a look at that. You've got the, the lines start to become taller because sleep's getting a little deeper. But also you have, see on the far left, on the left-hand side of stage two there, you got that little, um, there's like a little burst about halfway, about a, maybe a quarter of the way through where it's very active. The lines are really tight together. And then look at the far right of stage two. You see that big, huge thing, that big, huge thing. And that little small burst, uh, are basically how the brain transitions from l very light sleep to very deep sleep. And look at deep sleep, the fourth line down or a second from the bottom. Look at how far apart those are. They're so spread out and they're super tall. That's what your brain looks like when you are in a deep sleep. And then REM, REM totally blew people away. When they first looked at a sleeper and they saw their, what their brain was doing in REM, they couldn't believe their eyes um, because it is incredibly low uh, amplitude and the lines are close together and they, they thought like, oh my God, this almost looks like the person's awake. Much more on REM in a bit. Okay, so let's take a look at the sleep stages one by one. Um, the non-REM stages are these the, are the first ones, non-REM or NREM. And these are stage one, and this is like when you first fall asleep at the beginning of the night. When you first fall off and fall asleep at the beginning, you will be in stage one sleep. This is the lightest stage and it's very easy to wake up from. And you might have these little twitchy things, uh, these little twitches that, like your arms and legs. Uh, you might, you might, you can actually notice these in yourself sometimes. I've woken myself up with these. They're called myoclonic jerks um, during, during stage one light sleep. If you're in a stage one light sleep, uh, you might not even be aware that you were sleeping if you wake up from it. Um, and it's really easy to wake up from, but you might not, you might not even know you were asleep. And this is also when you can have that sensation that you're falling. You ever have that happen where you suddenly, <laughs> and you, you feel like you, you're falling? Um, well, that is a common stage one occurrence. And this whole thing lasts about a half hour, 30 minutes at the beginning of the night when you first fall asleep. Um, stage two is where you go next. Stage two is a little deeper and we can't really say much more than that. It's not the most interesting of the stages. Um, all we can really say is that it's deeper than stage one. Now, deep sleep is really uh, a, a fascinating stage. Um, when you're in a deep sleep, you're really difficult to wake up. Um, and if you do wake up, you might not know where you are. You might not know like what time it is or, you know, where you are or what day it is. You can be disoriented because you're, think about it. Your brain goes from this really, really slow stage and suddenly you're awake. It's got to kind of catch up to, to speed. It would be like, you know, jumping on a, having to go from zero to 60 in like one second. Um, this is also where sleepwalking happens and sleep talking. Now, some people, uh, many of us did, did one of these uh, in our childhood, and maybe don't do it so much anymore. 
Um, they are more common in, in, in kids, but there are adults and older kids who also sleepwalk and, and sleep talk, but these happen in deep sleep. And when they do happen, you don't remember them. And finally, REM sleep. Um, REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, this is where we have those clear, vivid dreams that we can remember. If you have a dream from like your childhood that you still can remember the details of, you still can remember you know, some of the story and what it was about, uh, that's almost certainly a REM dream. Um, and <clears throat> during REM sleep, you're, yes, your eyes are moving around under your eyelids. Um, that was, it, it's n no more uh, complicated than that. It just means your eyes move around. Um, but while you're in REM, your muscles are paralyzed. Part of your brain sends messages to your arms and legs and your neck to not move around, basically to stop moving. Because otherwise, if, if that didn't happen, you would act out your dreams and you would kick and punch and get out of bed. And, and often what happens is um, you could hurt the person. If you're, if you're sleeping in bed with someone, you could hurt them. Uh, and there is a disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder where the muscles are not paralyzed and the person does start to strike and kick their their what their spouse it's usually uh, older men that this happens to although it can happen to anyone all right now some of you will also have had this experience where you wake up and you you might open your eyes but you can't move that's called sleep paralysis it's basically the paralysis of rem sleep kind of hovers, hangs over while you're awake. And not only that, you might f feel like a pressure on your chest. That's common in sleep paralysis. Uh, they used to think that was a ghost or a demon back in the old days. Um, you might hear voices at, like you would in a dream. You might, you might even see some shadowy figures at the foot of your bed. And many people who have had uh, sleep paralysis say it's an extremely frightening thing to happen. And your breathing will be irregular and you will have um, a heart rate that, uh, that is also irregular. Your breathing was very steady during the other stages, but in REM, it starts to go very quickly. Now, this uh, chart here is going to show you how these stages work over the course of a night. Okay, it, it didn't go quite the way I wanted, but you will see that uh, across the bottom there are hours, one, two, three, all the way till eight, eight hours of sleep. And the stages are on the left from one all the way down to deep sleep. And notice how it that line starts at the top when you're awake and then goes down and then rises up to REM sleep about an hour and a half in. And about an hour and a half, 90 minutes after you fall asleep, you'll go into your first dream, that red area. And then you'll go back down into some more deep sleep and then you'll go back up around three hours in, so another 90 minutes and have your next dream. And look at those REM stages, they all happen around 90 minutes apart. So roughly every 90 minutes you will go into a dream during the night. The thing that happens though, is look at those red periods, those red, um, those red stages of the, the, red, the REM in other words, they get longer as the night goes on. See that? the red REM stages get longer. So in other words, the periods that you spend dreaming get longer and longer as the night goes on. And look at the deep sleep. That's the darkest um, part there at the bottom. After the first few hours of sleep, you don't have your deep sleep anymore. The first part of the night, there's more of a focus on deep sleep. But then as the night goes on, your REM stages get longer and longer and REM becomes the dominant uh, type of sleep. And I circled there a, um, that's called a sleep cycle from stage one light 
that light blue, see how it goes down to deep sleep and then up to REM? That is one sleep cycle. One sleep cycle, and you're going to have about five of them in a typical night. Okay. And this is the last of uh, the, la the, the end of part two. Sleep part two notes are ended, and I'll uh, see you on part three.